Good afternoon. I'm again in the middle of the, this August audience for the last um, so many years. Uh, the Little Sisters, if I may call them. Um, they are historians. I don't think you need any, uh, they don't really need an introduction. Tell me something. Uh, both of you seem to be seeped in the history of Delhi. Um, apart from the historical background, so why is it only because you live in Delhi that um, this is something beyond that? Uh, if I'll start, first of all, thank you so much to the organizers of the Orisha Lit Fest. I'm, uh, it's such a pleasure to be in this wonderful state and in this wonderful city uh, for both of us. So um, we are most grateful and uh, among such a, a great number of wonderful authors, readers. Uh, we always look forward to interacting more with readers as well. So um, thank you everyone so much for this. Um, uh, for me, uh, I'm a historian by uh, training, I would say, because I've studied history. Um, I did uh, a research, a couple of research degrees in history. So um, history was my first love. I actually came to Delhi's history not simply because I lived there, but also because I became interested in the cause of heritage protection. I started uh, doing heritage walks in Delhi. Delhi is a very historic place, of course, and it has a lot of these old monuments and all. And it, you know, uh, like Bhavaneshwar uh, is also one of those places which has an amazingly rich uh, built heritage. So, uh, uh, Delhi is like that. And I became interested in trying to preserve those and I started doing walks. And then I said, okay, let me read a little bit more about the history. And that's how my interest in Delhi, writing about Delhi uh, also developed. So, I was a historian before, but because of the walks around Delhi. So, yes, I think living in Delhi does, has had an impact on that. I just get back to you. I mean, the, the um, nature of uh, historical writing, writing of history has changed. The narration has changed a lot in the last kind of, I think, 20 years, where history is m more accessible to the ordinary reader, much more than like, you know, old days like Toen Bian. It's changed a lot. So, which means that a historian who's uh, like you, who's writing, about lesser monuments coming into the picture would have a certain amount of impact and influence on people more than that would have had on people who are really experts in history or you know, who are just history aficionados. There are a lot of monumental savagery happening in Delhi, so much of encroachment, so much of kind of you know, destruction, so much of complete callousness, now, and also a certain communal angle to it which has crept in the last 10 years. So as a historian, especially who has been championing Delhi, who has been taking people by introducing Delhi of the past to people, how are you doing anything or is the voice able to kind of, you know, stop at least some of the depredation which is going on in the historical monuments? Uh, well, uh, so there are two hats I wear. One is, of course, as a writer of history and that's where my academic interest comes in. Though, of course, all my, uh, I mean, all my writing it's never been for an academic readership. I always write for a regular readership and I try to make it uh, yeah, I hope, I accessible. So, uh, and really the walks that I do, historical walks, have also been with the aim of raising awareness among people. And um, I volunteered, I have volunteered for many years now, for about two decades, for the Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage. And for some years, I was also the convener of the Delhi chapter. And I think it has made a difference. I'm not saying that the difference can be uh, very palpably feel, uh, felt in the actual preservation of monuments, because these things continue to happen. Uh, demolitions, vandalization, I'm not saying it's not happening, but there is a greater, I think, uh, eye on monuments. I love the way it's cut the, the question. The way, uh, you know, it, it's, it's hard to, uh, you know, make those colorations, but there has been, for instance, let me just give you a very simple um, uh, example. 20 years ago, heritage was not something that figured in media stories. Today, you pick up a newspaper, and every other day, there will be some story about some monument. 
So just the fact that it's become something that people talk about, I think that is a result of um, this greater engagement um, uh, of people with knowing about what their city is. And Delhi is one place where everybody is running to just, you know, get by with their everyday work and don't look at things like the past and how their city reflects that. So I think it has made a difference. I don't know when we will start to see <laughs> greater effect on the ground. Thank you, Madhulika, by the way. I really enjoy the reviews you do for the magazine. Let me ask you a question about um, your subject, your detective. He's a very whimsical character. He's a very uh, anti-hero, you know, of a hero. And it's set in a very, um, it's in a very authentic Mughal setting, I may say. When, at least when you read, you kind of feel like that. As uh, Swapna was talking earlier, I, how much of research did you have to do to get it right? Okay, uh, let me first begin, of course, by echoing Swapna's thanks to everybody. Uh, those who organized, those who invited us, and those who are here. Thank you so much. Are, are you so, uh, you let me one? just give a little uh, background to what uh, our moderator is talking about. Uh, Muzaffar Jung is a historical detective who features in my first four books. So the first four books which I wrote, the Muzaffar Jung series, are a collection of detective novels which are set in uh, 1656 Delhi. That is the time when Shah Jahan had just shifted his capital from Agra to Delhi. And he had built this new city called Shah Jahanabad with uh, Red Fort at its, uh, you know, sort of fulcrum. And Muzaffar Jung is this maverick who is a nobleman, but he uh, goes about and he solves crimes in the city. For one book, he goes to Agra. Uh, so to answer your question, Muzaffar Jung, uh, actually I, it, the inspiration for Muzaffar Jung arose partly out of the fact that Delhi was the city I was most comfortable with. Sorry. Delhi was the city I was most comfortable with, you know, because I had spent, uh, by the time I wrote the Muzaffar Jung books, I had been in Delhi for almost 20 years. So uh, of all the cities I would ever been in, that was the city I was most familiar with. And I wanted to write a historical detective because while historical detectives are very, very uh, common outside of India, at that time, there was no Indian historical detective. Today, there are quite a lot of authors who are writing, uh, you know, detectives set in, say, colonial India. So there are a lot. But Muzaffar Jung is still the only pre-colonial, as far as I know, uh, you know, a major detective series. So uh, what had happened was that I wanted to write a historical detective. And because of my familiarity with Delhi, so I thought, OK, we'll write a story which is set in Delhi. And of course, uh, I think a lot of the research, one of the reasons why I chose the Mughal era is because there's a lot of uh, documentation. So there's a lot of stuff you can find fairly easily, even if you don't read Persian or Urdu or whatever. You know, if you read even English, there's a lot of material around. Uh, not just, and what I try to do in my books is not just talk about, um, you know, the court and stuff, but also how everyday people lived, you know, how, what were the sort of social norms around, what they ate, how they dressed, things like that. So there was a lot of material to do research. Plus, of course, you know, if you walk around uh, old Delhi, even if you just sort of wander around, you can get a feel of, you have to put in a lot of imagination, but otherwise you do get a feel of what it might have been like. Okay, this is not about myself. I wrote a book called The Brahmin, which was based in uh, Ashoka, period of Ashoka. I mean, research was exhausting. I mean, it is really exhausting because there's so little of research available. But while in Delhi, there is hell of a lot of research material possible, as I would kind of say. I mean, so is Agra. So to transpose uh, your story, the, the outlines of the story, the, 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 the character of the people involved on to that setting, uh, how much was the combination of research and imagination, like 50, 50, 40, 30? I mean, like, how did it, how did they feed into each other? Uh, you know, as far as uh, getting the two together is there, I think the background is mostly all historical research. It's only in, uh, say, the details of actually doing the plot, for instance, you know, and how people interact. That is 
fictitious. So I would say probably, it's probably 50-50. It's probably 50-50 because, you know, I mean, there's a lot of uh, interactions happening. And, of course, all the characters are fictitious. There are just one or two characters who are, like, glimpsed from a distance, usually. So it's like the emperor. So, like, the first Muzaffar Jung story begins on uh, the riverfront of the Yamuna, where an elephant fight is just beginning. And Shah Jahan is the one who throws up a, you know, he flips a coin to uh, sort of start the fight off. So it's just... These important people, the real people, I just glimpsed from a distance and very briefly. But otherwise, it's all fictitious characters. And so all the interactions which happen between them, all their conversations, those are all uh, fictitious. But what they eat, for instance, or how they dress, mm. or where they go in the city, you know, the monuments which are mentioned, those are all real. Okay, so, um, you know, historical... Crime fiction, let's put it that way. That, that actually started with the British, if I'm not mistaken. You know, Ellis Peters, the Catwell series, and Roy Jenkins, and all those stories about Elizabeth in England. Then you go back to, there's an entire series on a Roman, uh, you know, I forget Stephen the names Saylor. now. Yeah, uh, yeah. Also, Lindsay Davis. Uh, yeah. yeah, Lindsay, Lindsay Davis. Davis. Yeah, it's Falco. so much of yeah, it, you know, of so much of it. And uh, see, for example, if you look at uh, one particular genre, which is essentially Elizabeth crime fiction, which seems to stand out much more than the others, the era, uh, you know, of England at that particular time, Elizabeth in England, it was so full of espionage and intrigue and, you know, trying to protect England from the Catholic armies and stuff like that. Uh, when you wrote uh, your books, which set in Shah Jahan's, um, Shah Jahan's era, uh, was there that's, that kind of a dramatic kind of, you know, uh, historical events which influenced you into these narratives? This is actually an interesting period because, you know, Shah Jahan, he did not real probably, I don't know if he realized at that time, but he was on the end of being pushed off the throne. He was right on the edge of that because my stories take place in 1656, 1657. And uh, 1658, I think, Swapna was when uh, Aurangzeb came to the throne. So uh, Shah Jahan was, uh, you know, he was about to be pushed off the throne. And then Aurangzeb's coming to the throne was, uh, it was, the, the intrigue had started long before and he had already sort of been uh, sort of making pacts with his other brothers and sort of uh, conspiring against Dara Shuko and things like that. So, uh, it was an interesting period and there was intrigue happening. But yes, I will admit that I never got around to writing this book which was, I had planned to write a book which would be set in Aurangzeb's time, that you know, and Aurangzeb coming to the throne. Very interesting. Uh, I you never have to take a political position, though. I haven't got around to that yet, <laughs> so I don't know when that's going to happen. I'm not. I'm not trying to provoke a family quarrel here. Um, how authentic is her historical research? Oh, her historical research is very authentic because, in fact, uh, I think uh, so. It's interesting, you know. I mean, in the sense that for her. Uh, when you're writing historical fiction, the main thing is, it's, not, it's of course about historical um, events and individuals, but much more than that, it is about creating an authentic setting. So um, she really, I must say, puts in a lot of effort on that, and uh, therefore uh, that is uh, really good because it, it really sets that you know, one of the things that uh, I remember she told me once when she was writing her very first book was when she realized that tea drinking, for instance, tea drinking was not a big thing in India till very, very recently. So in Mughal times, it was actually coffee houses. Coffee was drunk and coffee was a very, it was a fashionable drink to do, drink and there were coffee houses and therefore her detective, uh, often ends up in coffee houses where he meets a lot of people. So those kind of authentic settings are, uh, is something that, uh, she, she's good at that and she puts, and because, this is simply because she puts in a lot of effort. Where I sometimes help is to give her book reading recommendations, say that maybe you read this and maybe you'll get, so I, I, I don't set, set myself as an expert on that, but she does all the work. But I, uh, I, I think one, like a little aside, I want to talk about this, that a lot of people 
will get their first taste of Mughal history, say, by watching a film or reading a novel or something like that, not by reading hard, hardcore history. So therefore, I think it becomes very important that this kind of fictional work, whether it's a, a movie or a detective or, or a historical fiction novel, and she's written other than mystery also, she's done, written other kinds of historical novels as well, uh, that if it has that authentic setting, at least somebody who may not read any other history yeah. book in, during their adult life will actually get something out of it which actually gives them a, a somewhat more authentic view of the past. Okay, this is something which I wanted to ask historians. How do you see history? I mean, do you see history as a linear progression of events? Do you see history as a context to explain the present or the past? Do you see history as a bridge between the consciousness of one civilization and the, and the, and the, and the perceptions or you know, the current intellectual or emotional life of the people you are, or the ethos you are living in? How do you see history? What's the definition? Not definition, how do you see yeah, history? Yeah, yeah. So, um, huh. I, I'm so glad you asked me this question actually because I think uh, this is something that needs to be addressed to an audience who may not be uh, people who have studied history beyond school. And I think a lot of the confusion happens because we use the word history for two related but not identical things. One is generally for the past and the things that happened in the past. We say this is history when we, are, when we mean that this is what that, that this, is, this is past, this is something that happened in the past. Now, we use the word history also for the study of that past. And this is really, you know, this is something that has to be seen because we don't do this with other disciplines. There is the natural world, maybe the plant world. We know that the plant world is something out there. Uh, we use the word botany for the study of that world. We don't mean that these two are identical. The study is not the thing. But here, we think that what historians do is somehow capture what is out there and present it to you. It's the same thing, it's not. So what happens is, what happened in the past is happened in the past. There is no way of actually capturing that in, very, in a very, uh, uh, shall we say, in a very direct manner. It's not something that is descending into our heads or we have some way of retrieving that. What history as a discipline does is it works on the, there is something called a historical fact and uh, looks at various sources, interprets them, analyzes them and gives explanations for what might have happened in the past. And there is a historical method by which you do it and therefore I feel that history as a discipline is important as well and uh, not you know, just by looking at some sources about the past, you cannot immediately become a historian. You need that training as well. So um, that, that, uh, that aspect, I think, is I important. Think. That distinction between an explanation for the past and the past itself um, are two things. Thanks. Um, the, we, you know, we lead uh, over to her. We, we lead, usually all of us lead very mundane lives. We get up in the morning, we brush our teeth, we have breakfast, go to work or not go to work or go to a party in the evening or not or whatever. But we don't realize that we're just blips. We're in the middle of history, right? I mean, this 100 years later or 20 years later, we would have been part of that particular period. Even if you don't have the emergency, did the same thing, you're rewarded, did the same thing, right? So as a writer of fiction, you... Look at the most dramatic aspects of history, you know, the blood, the murder, the gore, the elopement, the wars, the, you know. I mean, I mean, the, the dramatic backdrops of history is what a writer of fiction looks for. Uh, do you find uh, the particular period you'd put, uh, I mean, Shah Jahan, I mean, at the time segueing into Aurangzeb's line, he's still a prince at that particular, at that time. What, what, what were the backdrops you found most interesting to, you know, to bring to life the Mughal era at that time. I really, I really can't say there was any particular thing. You know, it's it's uh, less of 
the events that were happening and more of the right. spaces. You know, for instance, uh, the first uh, Muzaffar Jung book, uh, The Englishman's Cameo, is not set around any particular event. It is about, it happens in the wake of uh, Shah Jahan shifting the capital to Shah Jahanabad. But after that, it is the, uh, you know, it's the Red Fort, or it is the Jama Masjid, or it is Chandni Chowk, which is the setting, and it is not, uh, you know, there is stuff happening in the background. Yeah. You know, you know, uh, Aurangzeb's sort of getting restless. So, in, in fact, there was this very uh, amusing incident that uh, Aurangzeb had been sent to the Deccan as the Subedar of the Deccan, and there was apparently this mango tree, which is part, which was part of his suba, and it produced the most delicious mangoes in uh, all of the Deccan. And he was supposed to send an annual tribute of mangoes to Delhi. Yeah. And when he chose to keep that tribute back and enjoy all the mangoes himself, that like really uh, got Shah Jahan really annoyed. So that, that is that, you know, there, there are these little bits of trivia which I put in, but there's no overarching major event which is happening. No, I, I'm talking about more than the event. I, the, not what I'm talking about. See, like, I, I think after COVID, my memory is short. Um, you know, the modern historical fiction, uh, there is this amazing writer who has set the stories in the backdrop of World War II Germany. I mean, he's a German policeman who tries to balance his life or his investigations between the Nazis and the, and the actual mm -hmm. crimes. I forget the name he died recently. But what is interesting is the backdrop, the looming backdrop of the rise of Nazism, life under Nazism, then the slow decline of Germany into chaos, and then what happens after the war. So there's a backdrop against which a human crime is almost like a Dostoevsky aspect of, you know, a detective novel. So okay, you know, I, sh I should, I should uh, explain that a little bit, because you see, uh, with a detective novel, if you're going to write a detective novel which really uh, grips your reader and which makes sense, uh, you have to put a lot of effort into the mystery itself and the solving of that mystery. So it lessens your, uh, and especially in India, where uh, a lot of publishers are not willing to do very thick novels. Especially when you're writing detective fiction, they don't, they, they are very, very uh, strict about word counts. There's a comment right? on Indian publishing, not so the writing. So you cannot, you cannot do, you cannot, uh, there's really not much scope for giving a very detailed backdrop, you know. But uh, s having said that, I should say that the sort of thing you are saying about a very detailed historical backdrop, that is what comes through in my latest set of novels, which is the Delhi Quartet. The Delhi Quartet is a collection of four novels uh, which span 800 years of Delhi's history. So that begins with, uh, in about... 1192, when Mohammad Ghori came to India, and it ends with partition. So I've written the first two books so far. So the first book is like the setup of the Delhi Sultanate and 200 years into it. The second book, which is an unholy drought, uh, is up till the time of uh, between Temur's invasion and uh, Akbar's ascension. And that is where, because they're they are not detective novels, they're stories about everyday people living their lives against history being made. Yeah, I mean. And that is where I get a chance to really show how history is being made and how uh, the common man and the common woman are trying to somehow uh, come to terms with what is happening around them. You know, like for instance, uh, in the first book of the series, which was called The Garden of Heaven, there's this young boy who's about 12 years old. He's a farmer's son. And in the wake of the first battle of Tarain, which is where, of the, not the first battle, it's the, I think the second or the third battle, uh, which is when Muhammad Ghori defeated Prithviraj Chauhan. This boy suddenly finds himself completely orphaned. None of his family are alive anymore. Their fields have been completely uh, destroyed. His village has been destroyed. So he's alone. So how does he rebuild his life? You know, so that sort of thing. And it's, this is a thread which continues, which I try to continue through the, uh, through the series, that how history which has been made, which has been created around them, and there are, you know, sort of uh, events which are outside of their control, how they still affect the lives and the circumstances of everyday people. Right. You know, uh, over to you. I, I would not always agree that uh, history is written by the victors because 
it's subsequently rewritten by the next victors and the next victors keep going back and forth. So you really cannot divorce history from politics, from politics, and I don't, I don't mean what politics, I mean politics. I mean the political uh, ethos of that particular point when a certain thing is happening. How do you interpret Delhi in a historically political way? I mean the politics of uh, Aurangzeb or the politics of the Chauhans or you know the, inter the politics of the uh, you know the, 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 the one culture overtaking the other, establishing structures. Um, I think I think there are many dimensions to your question, and one of those is uh, the, I, the the thing of um, the first point that you mentioned that uh, you know it's a, it's a trite saying that uh, uh, history is written by the victors, and again there what we are talking about is another kind of history writing that is the history of the court chronicler the Shah Jahan's historian, who is a co captive courtier who is sitting there and chronicling the reign. And that kind of history writing, that kind of court chronicling is a very different thing altogether. You are an establishment, uh, you know, you, you want to project uh, that whatever reign it is in the best possible light, etc. So, so that's a very different kind of writing. I would not uh, strictly, I mean, I would um, draw a sharp distinction between that and professional history writing, uh, which hopefully one should be doing. And I'm not saying that uh, professional history writers are completely divorced from politics. Of course not. We are all living within uh, our own worlds and we are political people. And uh, yes, we look at, uh, but one, we are, we have uh, at least some of the tools and awareness, hopefully, to realize that we need to, uh, you know, uh, be professional historians and follow methods, etc., of our writing. But the way in which it uh, affects us, which is a very easy to uh, grasp way, is that we are aware. It's the questions we ask. What are the questions we are interested in asking to get today? And that is often reflected by the world we live in. True. And uh, what, we, uh, what we say, I mean, you know, a uh, hundred years ago, historians writing invariably wrote about the politics of their era, uh, or, or sorry, of the politics of the past. They talked about kings, they talked about uh, uh, empires and uh, all those kind of important, and they wrote about battles and things. And today historians uh, are more interested in the lives of people, uh, their, their social lives, their, uh, their cultural lives, their emotional lives. They, they are much more interested in trying to grasp uh, the diversity of people, not just uh, rulers. Uh, so right. so it's, uh, it's about what are the questions that you ask. And uh, uh, which is again, so, so in, for instance, I wrote, uh, my major book is The Gold Bo Broken Script, which is on the Delhi during the company period. And I, um, I, of course, it is about rulers as well, but it is an attempt to actually capture the lives and developments in a much wider sphere. So I'm not primarily only interested in rulers and what they do. I, I mean, I think the bell is told or rung, or which way we want to put it. Look at it. Um, you know, um, again, getting back to the depiction of history, uh, the Mughals painted the Hindus as uh, weak. The British painted the Maharajas as fops. And, you know, I would forget the, the, the description which Curzon had given of the Indian Maharajas as it's rather... Uh, we're not taking sides here. Would a historian be able to correct, like Manupalis tried to do, he tried to do it in one recent book I've been reading. Does a historian, can a historian correct a perception? And how accurate would the perception be? Because you're really going back in time to do that, right? Uh, again, I would, if I'm doing an honest job as a historian, first of all, I think I don't set out, I think a historian should not set out with an idea that they have an agenda to fulfill. That I need to clear up this and I need to prove that. I think that is, yes, you may be interested in a particular subject because something intrigues you about the past, but then from then on you have to keep an open mind and see what 
you find in history, see what your sources tell us, and try to present it as honestly as you can. And uh, so I hope that when somebody reads a book of history written by me, they get an idea of um, what I'm saying about the past and also on what basis I am saying that. Because uh, uh, it's, it's a little difficult to explain that, but the kind of narrative style that I use uh, is to incorporate some of that. So it, uh, I use a lot of actual quotations from historical figures, and then I weave my narrative around that. So uh, hopefully, people will get to look at the past a little differently. But uh, again, as I'm saying, I don't set out with that as a declared agenda. Yeah, though a lot of readers might not agree, writers are also human beings. Uh, with all the, you know, good and bad in them. Now, I'm asking, I mean, someone who writes non-fiction, someone who writes fiction, it's uh, impossible to, um, to, to not have a point of view when you're, you know, when you're writing something or reading something. It's impossible to be completely neutral. It doesn't exist except for the Buddha. Uh, how do you guys kind of, you know, divorce yourself from a point of view of what, you're, if what I'm reading you write? Yes, of course. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that uh, uh, neutrality. Neutrality is a very uh, neutrality only comes in because we think that the purpose of history writing is to pass judgment. Okay. I I disagree with that entirely. I'm I'm saying that my role as a historian is not to pass judgment on figures from the past. I don't. I I uh, I try and explain the past as I see it. And I give you reasons for why I see this as it's not my agenda at all to uh, uh, to pass. No, it's any not an kind agenda. I mean, I mean, a point you know. of view. So what would you anyway, say? but but uh, I I, I uh, again, as I feel that yes, of course, my own my own uh, circumstances, my own personality, all of that affects what I write. Absolutely. But I uh, I don't. Uh, uh, set out to write a work of fiction. So it's the okay. intent with which you start also has some. I think I should just take that forward. She doesn't set out to write a work of fiction. I do. Yeah. <laughs> so when you're writing a work of fiction, I have definite agendas. You do, right. I definitely have agendas and you can probably see it if you read my books. Okay, now I see her uh, coming yes. to end. There's no <laughs> last question. Do you sisters help each other writing fiction? Do you guys kind of, you know, feed into each other's knowledge, information, imagination? Uh, Mathulika, I, I always enjoy write, reading her books because she comes, because she has, uh, of course, it's a lovely story and I want, I love to read that, but uh, she has a lot of, uh, she is much more versatile than I am in my writing. I write, I'm a one trick horse. She's I elder, write right? about the history Kinda. of Delhi. She has these amazing interests. She writes fiction, she writes about food, she writes, she knows a lot about horticulture and, uh, you know, the pl and plant life and animal life and cinema. Uh, Cinema, yes, of course, cinema. No, that's Sajan, fabulous. I never saw one. Yes. So we, uh, uh, so uh, she, she has, in fact, the book that we collaborated in on last was a book on the gardens of Delhi, and I wrote about the history, and she wrote about the horticulture. So um, you know, I think I learn a lot from her. So um, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, as I said, she does a lot of the research, and I think most of the time I'm just recommending books to her. <laughs> but those are like really helpful because uh, seriously, Swapna is my greatest resource. Thank you so much for these two Nipper babies mutually. Thank you so much. I really much. enjoy your books. Thank you for coming. Thank you.